here from Spectrum TV. Welcome to another episode. I am super excited today because I have one of my great friends and colleagues and master uh, thinker, educator, uh, Tony Ryan from Australia as my guest. Welcome, Tony. Oh, hi, Karen. It's just magic to be with you. Thanks for being with us. I know that there's been a lot of excitement that you were coming on Spectrum TV today. I've had a lot of messages and, uh, you know, you're so well known around the world. But for those who don't know you, who haven't maybe come across you, I'm going to ask where have they been. But uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself, Tony. Oh, the short version, a former teacher. I still am a full-time education advisor. I've worked in 12 countries with about a thousand schools. I call myself an education futurist. And so that is someone who does not predict the future in education. They help educators to prepare for it as well as possible. So that's what I do. Wonderful. So you're not, a, you're not navel gazing and you're not, uh, you don't have a crystal ball then. Oh, if I could have seen this coming this year, I would have done something about it as, <laughs> as we all would have. I think the only one who was was Bill Gates, didn't he put out a, a TED talk a few years ago? So <laughs> maybe he needs to be the futurist. Uh, look, if you don't know about Tony's prowess, he uh, is the author of The Thinker's Keys. You can see some of them above him, some of the graphics there. He has a wonderful book called The Ripple Effect and his latest book, The Next Generation, uh, preparing our kids for the uh, would it say for extraordinary future is a must read for every teacher, parent, educator. It is a fantastic book and one of the books we looked at in our book club last year. So Tony, Tony and I were actually together right before this pandemic sort of really hit. Well, when it just hit, weren't we? I was actually staying at your place and I came back from your place to New Zealand to self-isolate. And while I was at Tony's house, uh, we started talking about, well, I think Tony started the idea about uh, giving hope, hope to uh, students, hope about the future, uh, because, you know, when, when a pandemic hits, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of uh, worry and frightenedness. And Tony being the optimal positivity person, you know, we need to give children hope. And so we launched a, a project that he and I have been working on called Sharing Hope. And I'll put the details of that below so you can uh, see that. But Tony, tell us about why you think hope is so important for uh, the future for our teens and our children right now. Oh, hope is critical. I mean, psychologists will talk, you know, talk with you about this. Now, funnily enough, I'm not like a, a total optimist. I'm, I'm what is called a realistic optimist. And I, that's what I want children to have as well, to be realistically optimistic about the future. You know, Pollyanna is not going to do well. The world's not perfect. It never will be. I actually think the world's a beautiful mess. Always has been, always will be. And especially right now, of course. Hope uh, gives energy for something up ahead. So a six-year-old needs to know they're going to a birthday party in two months' time. You know, a 14-year-old needs to know that they're going to have a really cool time with some sporting event in another four months' time. You know, having those things to look forward to is really important. And at a macro level, you need to think that as well. The dilemma is we can't always predict that future. You know, it sort of feels uncertain, uneasy. People sometimes say it's very negative. Uh, not necessarily. You know, there's several ways of looking at the future. One is that you can't predict it. Another is, to some degree, you can. The one I like looking at with the future is that you can actually create it. And that's what I want kids to have. And so that's why you and I have done this project, because what we did was we found some wonderful thought leaders and got them to give us a minute or two on what they believe children need at this time so that they can feel that sort of hope for up ahead. OK, so that's why we put it together, Karen, didn't we? And so, yeah, now, absolutely. you know, we have children uh, who are listening to this and going, you know, that can be done. And also their parents as well. I think they need it just as much. So we... Uh, if Again, I'll put the link below a little later, but the the idea was that we've got people talking about resilience, about joy, about aspiration, and uh, just giving children uh, some quick ideas that can help them be the best that they can be and to have that hope for the future. So it's been great to work on that. And of course, both Tony and I, and I'm speaking for him right now, but both Tony and I would love more people to contribute to that. 
So if you've got some ideas you'd like to be able to share uh, and share in hope, uh, let us know and uh, send us in a one minute, two minute video and we'd love for, for you to be part of that as well. And you know, partly with that, Karen, wouldn't we love to have some uh, younger people do it too? I was, I was delighted in seeing some sharp 12 year olds giving their perspective to other 12 year olds on how to approach this reasonably optimistically. I think that's a great idea. So, yep, challenge for all those teachers and parents out there to be able to, uh, you know, find out who, who's willing to do something and let us know. That would be great. Thanks. So, you talked um, talk about the future and uh, children. Uh, and so, this idea of uh, why are you such a big advocate of our children in the future and making sure they have those skills? Well, you know, that depends on what skills you're talking about. You know, everyone in the, on the planet today, you know, educators, parents and otherwise are trying to work out how to best prepare kids for it all. And it's not enough just to keep cramming lots of content down their heads, even though content is fantastic and beautiful and rich, and it's necessary. What we need are the capabilities they need. So a capability is something that makes you more capable. So something like, for example, adaptive agility is a capability and it will help you to cope with whatever happens up ahead. Uh, the ability to think effectively, critically, creatively, and there's many subcomponents to that, is just as necessary. So they're the capabilities. They're the ones we really need for the times up ahead. Do you think that's something new? Because I always think that that's the capabilities that have probably held humanity together for centuries. I can imagine that my great grandparents had to be creative and had to have that agility to be able to be successful. Yes, you are absolutely correct. Uh, some things that are thousands of years old are still relevant. There's a however to that, and it's that there are many new things coming over the horizon. So tech skills, you know, coding capabilities, you know, these and you know, when I talk adaptive agility, there are reasons why that's more pertinent now than it was, say, 100 years ago, given the exponentialities of change. So those grand, gorgeous grandparents of yours probably saw very little change in, say, 40 or 50 years, whereas now we can see so much in just a couple. And, you know, can I point out that this next year is going to be an example of that? We are going to see so much dramatic change, and a lot of it, by the way, good. So that, that won't be seen that way by some people who are struggling, and I pay respect to that. The thing is, there will be more change in this couple of years than probably in the last 20 to some degree. And that's how human history works, by the way, for kids and grown-ups. It doesn't smoothly keep going up all the time. It actually goes up steadily, then it blips dramatically, then it might drop down a bit in terms of the rate of change. That's why adaptive agility is more relevant now than it's ever been before. So how do you know you've got adaptive agility? How do you, how do you teach this? Um, I'm fascinated. Yep. Okay. You know, like one obvious question is to ask, what, how do you respond when you have a problem? You know, and I ask kids that, you know, what really do you do? Okay, unpack it. Can I get into pairs, explain to the other person what really happens when something hassles you? Do you just whinge and complain? Do you just sulk a lot and just blame everyone else? Do you actually sit and mumble about it for a while and you just sit down and get a piece of paper and work out what you're going to do and, you know, work out the, the program uh, in terms of resolving it? That's one way of coping with adaptive agility or building it up. It's simply having strategies on what to do when things go wrong. And kids need more of those. One really powerful thing with this adaptive agility is to be aware of how change occurs in your head and your life in general. So, you know, sometimes I sort of uh, say to children, look, here's what happens when you have to learn something new and you don't want to do it. You'll start by ignoring it and hoping it goes away. And then you'll start to really, you know, fight back against it and complain to everyone, your parents, teachers, and otherwise. And then maybe a week later, you start to accept that it's going to be, need to be done. And then you actually get on board with it and you fully engage with it. So to understand those sort of steps in terms of change is a really powerful thing for children. Okay, and we even map it out for them so they can see clearly the four or five stages they're going through. So the next time they go through something, they're meta, meta aware of how that change is actually affecting them. So that's it. there's a couple of ways of actually teaching adaptive agility. I, I love that idea of the, the meta level because, uh, as you know, and many of the viewers know, I work uh, very closely with Art Costa and Ben Akalik, and one of the key strategies that we talk about is that metacognition, that ability to think about your thinking and to be able to have students be aware of what's going on inside their heads so then they can have 
I guess that adaptive agility so they can then go, actually, this isn't what I want to do. And to be able to make those conscious decisions and that conscious thought about how they're going to act. One of the things I'm hearing during this whole COVID-19 is this whole idea of the new normal. And uh, yet, uh, we're also seeing, and I'm not judging, I'm just reporting, uh, that I see so many of them just rushing back into takeaway foods when we've had so many weeks of great cooked meals and back into the old habits. And uh, so that ability to stop and think about what is it you want in the future, what is it you want in your life, is, of course, really key. Okay. Would you like to hear a really practical idea on how to teach metacognition as such? Absolutely. Okay, I, can I introduce you to my pet puppet here? This is Cookie. I'm an Aussie, so I'm into you know, Aussie birds, but you know, whatever country you're from, find your own little puppet. And you actually have every child with one little finger puppet or just a stick puppet or some soft puppet, and you get them to talk to it loudly. So they just say something like, hey, Cookie, yeah, how am I going to do this maths problem? They then pretend to be a ventriloquist, so they get the cookie to talk back to them. So it's like it's shaking like this, going, well, have you thought about going back through your screen? Or did you go and ask Brody? So they learn how to talk aloud to it. A few days later, they don't talk to it. They actually think to it. So they actually look at it like this, and they're actually thinking the words in their head. And then this thing thinks back to them by moving like this. So they learn how to have the conversation inside their own heads. A few days after that, you get rid of the puppet. And by then, not all, but most children learn how to have this conversation in their own head. Really, we're two people. Like I'm fascinated by extraordinary talent and people who are exceptional and they all know how to be two of them. So the first one is the physical self, the one right there. The second one is their meta self. So it's you maybe a meter away watching you. And then you can actually have the conversation with that person. It's a very important thing for children to be able to do. Um, absolutely. And Art Cosler actually says that uh, only a half to two thirds of people are aware of that meta self that they're not actually even aware that something's going on. So another strategy that I've seen that you can use in the classroom is for teachers to get children to say affirmations out loud and then get them to shout them um, inside the head, whisper them inside their head and be able to uh, you know, just be able to be aware that they have control over that voice inside their head and then be aware of that voice. Yep. So uh, yeah, lots of wonderful strategies there. Thank you. What about the idea of, do, what other strategies do you see that children need to be effective thinkers? Because it's all about being able to be problem solving, you know, this adaptive agility. Can they, can they solve the problems that are being thrown at them? What other strategies do they need to be able to be an effective thinker from your perspective? Oh, well, you know, how long's a piece of the proverbial string, you know, like, there are two ways of looking at thinking. One is the big picture and the other one is the parts. So the big picture is things like the metacognition and an awareness of frameworks that you might use. The parts then, like a jigsaw, you know, the bits and pieces coming together are the actual strategies that you might use. So those strategies need to have a framework of the big picture. So habits of mind is a big picture. Then you've got all the parts that go into it. So that's it for a start in terms of thinking. You know, interestingly enough, in terms of thinking, I just finished a website last night for my Thinker's Keys and I completely redid it. So I put a whole lot of material in there for free, all these short videos explaining all these different strategies. I've got a section called Beautiful Ideas where I'll just put a blog up, you know, of different things that I love. I've got a whole lot of provocations and uh, sort of uh, projects, mini projects for thinking. So that's just at thinkerskeys.com. So in terms of your question, there is just a whole lot of practical material. So to wrap up on that, oh, look, thousands of things. I love design thinking. If I had my wish, it would be that every 12-year-old on the planet knew how to engage in design thinking. You know, mm. so for example, they might be developing some cutlery for all the people who have arthritis and can't work, you know, use their hands properly. So they start by empathizing with older people to find out what it really feels like. And then they might define what the real issue is and how to resolve it. And then they, I come up with ideas on how to resolve it. Then they develop a prototype, perhaps on a 3D printer. And then they test it on those people they talk with at the start to see if it works. And they keep refining it and improving it. I would love to see children doing that over the next year in terms of creating that new normal, that new education, that new world. And by the way, that is coming. It absolutely is. That's fantastic. You mentioned empathy. And I know that in your book, uh, 
this one here, the next generation. Uh, you mentioned that empathy is going to be one of the uh, key strategies and the gold of the 21st century. Can you say more about that? Empathy has different levels. Uh, so one is where you can perceive that someone is hurting, though you have no feel for it. And you get to the other end where you, you can see that someone is in trouble and you consciously do something about it. So you have a continuum of that. And it's really important to teach kids, you know, this empathy. And I believe it can be taught. So, for example, you can actually use images of people's faces and you show them to children and you get them to determine to some degree how that person is feeling. You know, so there's lots of ways of doing that. Though empathy, according to the longitudinal research, is massive. So, you know, many people have got into this one and they found that if a seven-year-old exhibits clear empathy for another person when they're hurt, they fall over, they're in trouble, at the age of 27, they're more settled, they're more focused. And these are, this is totally generic and correlation doesn't necessarily lead to causation, though, you know, 20 years later, they live a more productive, fulfilling life because they have that deeper self-worth that is able to be able to work with other people. Because bluntly, there's only two groups of people on the planet. There's you and there's everyone else. And you need to balance equally between those two. And if you mess up on that balance, you're in big trouble. So if you're 90% yourself, you're just a selfish individual who's taking up too much space on the planet. The trouble is if you're 90% everyone else, you never look after yourself and you don't pay respect to your own well-being. So it's important to find that fable balance. And part of it is to have deep respect for self and then empathize with other people. And the funny thing is some people go, empathy is a weakness. I don't agree. I think it's a strength. And I've had enough of people saying it's just a female thing, like female intuition. It, yes, it is. So it's also a male thing. In fact, I think you're a better male if you don't have deep empathy for others, especially children and anyone you love, of course. Actually, uh, interesting you say that because I think that's uh, one of the big topics that's coming through this century for uh, male speakers is that being vulnerable and uh, showing empathy and having that, uh, showing the heart and not having to be the, the tough bo bloke guy, which has been possibly the traditional uh role model of the man and so yeah so coming into your own yeah look both both sexes are beautiful and amazing and they have their strengths and maybe weaknesses sometimes however they're both amazing and we need to pay respect to that and it doesn't mean it weakens the male to be empathic it strengthens the male one of the things I've noticed over the last several years as I even uh, blog about real personal issues or uh, share some vulnerability is how many people say, wow, you're so strong. Wow, that's so amazing. And, and how much more respect they have because I share some of that. Because, of course, none of us are perfect all the time. So uh, thank you for that perspective. What about uh, student agency? There's a lot of children right now who are at home learning or going to stay at home learning or choosing to stay or, you know, in New Zealand, we've still got distance learning. Universities are going to be continuing for a wee while. We may go to level two next week. We don't know. It's, it's been talked about today. But there's a lot of students who are having to do this on their own. I'm hearing parents say, you know, their kids aren't doing the work at home, the teachers are emailing, or some of the parents are going, my kids just love learning at home. So what is that? What is student agency and the role of that for our children, particularly in this COVID-19 era? You know, as you described that there are different children responding in different ways, well, welcome to teaching and parenting, because we all know there is always a continuum in terms of this. You know, when I go into classes now, I find perhaps you know, people might, you know, vary with me on this one, 10% have little idea about how to take personal agency and develop self-control. Self-regulation is a key. Every, all of this is linked, of course, because that thing comes to the metacognitive awareness of self. Okay, so then you can make personal choices on what to do. Agency is going to see a, a massive resurgence and it's been building up for 20, maybe a thousand years anyway, though partly because of all of the remote learning, because generally it almost could not happen for a child who did not have some degree of deep awareness and self you know, regulation and be able to make choices. And funnily enough, it's also coming down in part to the extrovert in, introvert type dynamic too, because the feedback from a number of kids, especially secondary children, is that when they're introverted, they much prefer to have that full agency of choice in terms of what they do, getting out of bed at 10 a.m. in the morning, 
working through to eight o'clock at night, taking breaks whenever they want, wearing their slobbiest clothes, you know, according to the mood, not having to do that full dynamic social interaction all the time with everyone else, which can exhaust a lot of introverts. You know, too often we apply one size fits all. Like we say, everyone needs to learn how to socialize with millions of people all the time. Actually, not always. <laughs> you know, so things are vary in terms of that. All that notwithstanding, agency is massive. And funnily enough, it's not about the kids. It's, it's more about the growing ups. Because if we're into that 1990s notion of the ego, if I'm in control here and responsible for everything, there will never be a deep sense of agency in a classroom. And that applies to parents as well. So what we need to guide and support, we need to simply create the environment where children have deep agency, deep choice. It doesn't mean they go and do whatever they want all the time. They have to be aware of responsibilities and protocol. However, they truly can make choices. And to wrap up on this, you know, like in my years of teaching, I can always remember the way kids would grow overnight when they had a big responsibility to do something. You know, they had to organize a whole sports day and they'd come along and they'd be serious and focused and deliberate and they'd just go beyond their years in terms of what they offered. And I'm thinking to myself, why can't that happen with everything else they do as well? So we need to build in this concept of agency as much as we can. Uh, you remind me that when I go into schools and often have done model lessons and uh, showing teachers how to put some of these techniques into place, uh, one of the hardest things for the teachers is to actually step back and allow agency, allow children to fail, allow them to make mistakes, allow them to do the learning. Because I see so many teachers who just want to jump in and rescue and help. And perhaps that makes them feel better. It makes them uh, feel like uh, they've contributed, but actually possibly they're actually taking away from the learning. And so that uh, agency uh, is part of that is teachers being able to step back and allow and not have to be that control as you talked about. You know, when you held up my book before, I remember when I was doing some research for it, I went into quite a bit of data in terms of what happens in the last few years with that. And what we're finding is that well-meaning parents and educators jump in too quickly. Now, it's a fine line here because as educators, we are so rushed to try and get through as much as we possibly can. So we feel that we can't afford that sort of time. The dilemma is we've got to find it somewhere. So what we're finding is on average, at least in uh, first world countries, perseverance is starting to drift down a bit. Kids won't stick with something so much because they know as soon as they like look like they don't know what they're doing, some well-meaning adult is going to come along and go, oh, let me help you. Here's how it's done. And kids just go, hey, this is cool. I'll just wait until someone comes and does it for me. You know, and that's the whole Google thing as well. I see that so often when a child in a classroom has a teacher aide or someone who's working very closely with them. And I watched one student who was struggling to write some of the study tips I was teaching and uh, the teacher, the teacher aide helping. And then after the third one, the child just actually handed the book to the teacher aide and said, you do it. <laughs> it was a great example that sometimes we jump in too fast, too quick, and uh, they just give up. They just like, oh, well, if you do it, then I don't have to. Yeah, a great teacher knows how to find a balance with that. Yeah, and so it's, it's, always a, it's always a bit of a, a tightrope, isn't it? Uh, I know when I wrote my book, Project Genius, I talked a lot in that book about uh, one of the hardest things when children are doing projects is to know when to jump in and know when to uh, step back. And one of the feedback from the teachers I interviewed for it was that often it's the students that you don't expect that you're going to have to jump in for. And those students that you think you're going to have to be holding their hand the whole time, they just go for it. So it's not always how we um, envisage. Yep, yep. I remember reading the book. It's just a fantastic read and you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So, Tony, we're in this COVID-19. Of course, we, as I said, we're coming out possibly into level two in New Zealand. And, but it's not, it's not going to be over. You know, like when we get to level two, I'm hearing people uh, saying, oh, look, it's nearly over. It's not over. But I'm interested in your perspective of what do you think we've learned as far as education is concerned and the future of education? <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay, $64 million question and all of that. I think we've learned lots of things. And funnily enough, not always things that people think of initially. 
So one, for example, is the worth of education. You know, like there's, there's a hashtag I saw going around that goes something like double teachers wages. <laughs> and, you know, and it's coming from parents who are so exasperated with trying to just get two young children to learn. They think, how the heck does someone do 28? So, you know, there's that sort of thing. And, you know, politicians are now realizing the worth of it and not just the baby, the meta babysitting thing either, but realizing that if we went without education for three months, then, you know, it's going to turn the world in its ear because we won't have young children qualified to go through to university or other things. You know, that sort of stuff's going on. I think another big lesson we're learning from all of this, and I hope we take it into account, is the wellness, not just of the children, but also the teachers. So at this time of recording this, you know, like, Easter was a month ago, I'm still to meet a teacher anywhere in the world who took a holiday in that week or two. You know, they just worked all the way through because they care so much about kids and they want to do the best they can. You know, I think near enough is good enough sometimes. And this is coming from someone who's like obsessive about quality. So maybe we need to learn that one too. You know, there's only 28 hours each day. We can't fill all of them in, you know, so we need to get that proverbial life. The whole dynamic of technology, certainly a third of teachers have been pushed something remorselessly into, you know, how to best use it. We won't go back or forward to just being online only, not for a long time, though certainly we've learned some benefits of being able to co-create and connect with other people all over the planet. Because anytime you need a response to anything, there's someone on the planet who knows the answer. So if you know how to connect in that way, you know, I often have teachers getting in touch and saying, can you give me 10 minutes with my class? because I want to ask you three questions about what you wrote. You know, I'm always happy to do that whenever I can. And the thing is they're tapping in as much as they can. You know, funnily enough, I think one of the biggest things that will come through is the worth of being real people, connecting with real people. Most teachers I talk with and just about every child I talk with says they really actually miss the classroom. Now, isn't this a good thing? Because in ages past, a certain a minority of teachers would com complain about having to go to work and like three quarters of the kids would complain about being there. I think that's going to change around because I've always said that anytime you've got a small problem in your life, you need to find a bigger problem. And then the small problem just doesn't look too bad after all. You know, so people are going to look at this as like, wow, we can go back to being in a classroom again. So we'll have a deeper respect for it. You know, there are a few things I think are going to come through. But yeah, maybe my, my wrap up point with all of that is that, you know, people talk about the new normal and the new whatever it is up ahead and then maybe the new education. Well, you know, we are going to be recreating up to a degree, up to a degree life on this planet. This is our chance for finally truly doing something about so-called climate change and a whole lot of inequitable issues happening on the planet right now. And it's draw it's dragged us to the core in terms of what's going on. So we may as well start to reinvent the sort of world we really want and guess which profession is going to be most pertinent with this one. You know, it's education because it won't be just a quick fix. It'll take time and it'll take great educators who know how to lead these children forward into creating that world up ahead. So to me, that's probably the biggest scene of all with what's coming up. One of the things that I've seen also, and uh, we haven't talked about this, but is the teacher agency. I'm seeing and hearing some teachers saying, I'm loving being able to do that blended learning model. And on Spectrum TV last week, we had Kate, Catelyn Tucker uh, from America, who's a blended learning specialist. Off camera, she said to me, you know, she's been pushing this blended learning uphill for years. And now everyone's like, we need it. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like snowballing, uh, which is fantastic. But and many of us who uh, I guess are in that role of uh, bringing new ideas feel that way for a while. We're pushing things uphill until people really see the, the value and the need. But this teacher agency of teachers being able to maybe work uh, from 2 o'clock in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night putting together videos, posting them, and then, you know, doing what they want in the morning, sleeping in, having some family time, and then, you know, being able to also do that. I think there's going to be some really great models uh, that might come out of this. If we take some time and we think about them and we uh, make, do some planning around it. So. Oh, you are spot on. And I've been nodding for the last two minutes because flexibility will become, you know, the key to the delivery of, like, learning on this planet. And goodness me, you know, the possibilities, they really are. They're very special. And you're spot on with the teacher agency. Just as much as we talk student agency, 
you know, like the whole bit about working from home is going through revolutions. You know, I have friends in London who are saying, you know, they, they, they've had enough of driving three hours every day to get to an office where they just then have to do the off, off, you know, office gossip for hours as well. And they're being much more productive. And I love the, like the, the, the really strong focus on every child that's coming through with this too. You know, my gorgeous daughter is a, an infant's teacher. And although she's working harder than ever, and boy, that's saying something, at the same time, she's saying, I'm finding out so much about these children, including when they've got the video on at home and the parents are doing something in the background. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things happening with this. It, big changes coming. I said a while ago, the, the blip, we're in the blip and we're going to be in that, you know, accelerative blip for quite a while yet. Yeah. Just slight lag there, I was pausing. Thank you, Tony. Look, uh, I think we could, as we do when we're together, we could talk for hours uh, and uh, uh, try and solve the world's uh, problems and education at the same time. But as, to wrap up, I would really like to thank you, Tony, for your time. I do want to let the listeners and the viewers know that uh, Tony has also agreed to uh, be a presenter at the Teachers Matter Online Summit, which is on the 16th to the 20th of, or 16th, sorry, to the 19th of July. And so he will be sharing some uh, further ideas and strategies uh, during that with the other, there's about 27 other presenters over the three days that will be sharing ideas. And so Tony will be back for that. So I'm um, delighted about that. So thank you. And thank you for taking the time to uh, chat with uh, me and uh, the viewers today. As we uh, finish up, I want to let you know that next week on uh, Spectrum TV on Tuesday at 4 p.m. New Zealand time, we have Natalie Cutler Welsh, and she has this wonderful branding idea of, or well, she talks about upping your brave. And I love that because, you know, as we step back into the classroom, as we step back into the world, as we move from level three to level two, I think. I think being your brave is going to be something that's going to be very important to be aware that, you know, it's going to be possibly scary. We've got children who are going to be scared, parents who may be frightened. And what do we need to do as educators to up our brave, to be strong, to be focused, to be able to cope with all the things that could be thrown at us at that time? And of course, as I've always said, the better we are personally, the better we can be professionally. So thank you. I hope you can join me at four o'clock next Tuesday. Again, thank you very much, Tony. And everybody, please stay safe and keep learning. Thanks, Karen.